reality. Therapist perception. Hello and welcome back to Reactivity TV. I'm Amy Albero and I'm a licensed therapist. I am Chris. I'm not a licensed therapist, but I have a lot of opinions about this episode and she's going to let me talk about them. I also have a lot of opinions and we are going to get into what I think was the most shocking episode ever. But before we do, please be sure to hit that like button at the bottom of this video and also make sure that you are subscribed to our YouTube channel. It is this small thing that actually goes a really, really long way. And to those of you who've been doing it, we really, really appreciate it. Yeah. And also hit that bell icon so that you'll be alerted anytime we post new content to the channel. Yes. All right. So let's get into this shit show. Okay. So I have a couple of questions. As a newbie to the nation, um, a couple things popped up um, it, it, for, for me question-wise. The first is um, I noticed that there was a great deal of disparity between the amount of airtime that we got between the three hometowns. Mm -hmm. Historically speaking, does that matter? Does that indicate to us, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a Vegas gambler, um, it, can I glean anything from, from the airtime? I don't think so. I mean, they're making a TV show. So I guess who got the, the least airtime, Leslie? Leslie, by, by a significant point. Yeah, so it's probably just, you know, n nothing much to see there. So, I, you know, it's all about entertainment value. So. Okay, fair. So next question was, does the order matter? Um, also, no, we don't actually know if they were even shown in the um, order that they were like given to us on TV. So again, not necessarily. Okay. So it's really just whatever entertainment value mm -hmm. they think is there. They're not trying to, to sort of manipulate mm -hmm. us in any way, shape or form into thinking one thing versus yeah. another. Where order tends to matter more is fantasy suites, hmm. which we can talk about in a couple episodes. That's that's, I believe next episode, correct? No, we have women tell all. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So uh, my next question then is which of the I love you's was the most shocking? Um, all of them. Uh, I, while we were sitting next to each other watching this episode, um, and we don't talk about the episodes too much um, because we want to save it for, for more of a natural reaction here. Um, the gasps coming from the couch. I kept looking over as a newbie to this. I was like, oh, okay, I think this is not normal. Um, one thing that I do want to say is that you cannot actually love three people at the same time. That's not how love works. Um, you know, love is an action. It's a set of actions that you take. It's a sacrifices that you make to make one other person's life um, significantly better and more fulfilling. And you cannot make those sacrifices for three people at the same time, that they're mutually exclusive. So um, I, for one, thought Gary was maybe a little bit more evolved in his understanding of love than perhaps he is, because we got three I love yous, two to the women, three to face the camera. Um, and I thought that was pretty shocking. So this leads me into my next question. Mm -hmm. And I'm like four questions deep, and we're not even into the episode mm -hmm. yet. Um, which one of the I love yous is going to hurt the most on a rewatch? In totality, when we consider all the players, the, the women, Gary, the families involved, which one of these I love yous is going to hurt the most? Well, I didn't actually answer your first question, which was, which one was the most shocking? Oh, I guess I did. I said they all were. Yeah. They all were. I think what, actually, if I were to say which was most shocking, I guess it depends how we're going to define shocking. Uh, the faith I love you in front of the family mm. with the make out, I mean, what am I watching? Which one's going to hurt the most? Uh, okay, so there's a huge part of me that is really happy that Gary did not tell Teresa that he mm. loved her to her face. Yes. Because I think that would have been absolutely devastating for her and her family. Yes, yeah. Um, as the first man that Teresa has ever brought home, that would have just been a killer. And I wonder if, if Gary knew that. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot about the Teresa family dynamic that I would run screaming from, quite frankly. And I was really, you know, out uh, on, on her entirely. Really prior to this, I assumed she was gonna be number three anyways. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think that that would have been pretty devastating for her. Um, I think that that is probably gonna be the one on rewatch that's going to hurt the most um, in, in a utilitarian fashion. Like who's, if you add up all the pain of all the people that have to rewatch that, I think that one's going to be the one that that we're going to hear about on, say, a Women Tell All or or an After the Rose type situation. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I got one other question before we actually get into our topics for today. Okay. The grandkids. Mm -hmm. 
hated their involvement on a variety of levels. Um, I Just before we get into the main part of the episode, give me your 10 second thoughts on this. I thought it was somewhere between cruel, um, emotionally manipulative. Um, I didn't like how they were utilized. I didn't like how they were basically propped up to, to be you know, comic skits, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't like trying to explain to them later on what they were actually involved in. I, I thought it was a, a a real complete miss on every level, and I hated to see it. Your mm-hmm. thoughts? Yeah, we did not need the grandkids. I I agree. It was a little exploitive. I, I didn't I didn't love it. I get in some in some ways, and in actually a couple of ways, like the justification for them being there. I think from a show perspective, like, like they were the only levity in this episode and we really needed it. Like this was like such a heavy hometowns episode. So I think they provided that. Um, But yeah, like in a, in any other circumstance, like if this wasn't a TV show, then, then no way. Yeah. It was like way way too soon, too confusing, all of that stuff. Yeah. They should have kept it at siblings and, you know, sons and daughters and, and called it a day. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really just did not like, the inclusion of the grandkids and all three of them had grandkids that were all roughly the same age mm-hmm. and we got sort of that same you used the word exploitative i i agree it just felt exploitative to me mm-hmm. and i i didn't like any part of it so yeah um buckle up kids we did not <laughs> we did not like this episode well no that's not fair no, it was we liked, very entertaining we, we liked this episode but we did not like what happened so please don't hit that dislike button <laughs> still hit the like button but we were this was Get ready for some criticism. I just want to take a quick pause to tell you that Revive is hiring. In our Miami and Pittsburgh offices, we have full and part-time W-2 and 1099 clinician positions available. And this includes both postgraduate and associate level licenses in addition to fully licensed clinicians. In our Connecticut offices, we have full-time, fully licensed W-2 clinician positions available, including clinical supervisor opportunities. If you are interested in working for a company that values community, work-life balance, and your personal and professional growth, then we want to meet you. Find a link to our website in our bio. All right. So shall we actually get into the scripted part of our show today? (laughs) (laughs) Like our actual structure? Yes. Well, in terms of the summary of the episode, pretty straightforward. We see three hometowns. Uh, We go to New Jersey with Teresa. We go to Washington State with Faith. And then we go to Minnesota with Leslie. And we meet all of their families, as we just said. And then we end with a rose ceremony where- Kind of. Yeah, we're left on a cliffhanger. We, we know one woman that is going to Fantasy Suites, which we're definitely not surprised by, that Gary oh. wants to take Leslie to Fantasy Suites. Um, and then we, we don't really know what happens because Gary must have realized he dug himself into quite a hole here and doesn't really know what to do. Um, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I would like to know, um, in your opinion as a therapist, is was Gary experiencing like an actual full-on diagnosable panic attack? Was that what that was? Because it looked pretty pretty intense. I'm me. I'm not here to diagnose, and I was not there, so I don't know. But it wouldn't shock me if he was experiencing something like panic or anxiety, um, like to the level that like he he couldn't breathe, he was doubled over. Um, so it sounded like the the pressure, the stress, the anxiety the like re- regret the guilt like all of those emotions were coming to a head for him at the very end how much do you think the i love you's played a factor into his guilt there um i hope a lot of it like i i think whatever we can get more into that but yeah i'm pretty sure a lot of it yeah okay so shall we roll into first hometown Teresa? yes okay um you start us off um what did you like what did you dislike what, what do you think was noteworthy here Okay, so with Teresa, we got to meet her um, two sisters. So Teresa's the middle sister, which was interesting. You're the middle middle brother. I am the middle, yes. Mm-hmm. The forgotten, the unloved. <laughs> I shouldn't say the unloved. The forgotten is the correct word. Forgotten yes, the forgotten. Correct. Yeah. Um, and we also meet her daughter, son-in-law, and her uh, grand- grandkids. Mm-hmm. And okay, so what what stuck out to me as relevant pieces of information here are Gary is the first man that Teresa has brought home ever, um, beyond obviously her husband. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a really, really important piece of information. The other things going on that I think were really relevant were um, Teresa's daughter's um, reactions to Mm -hmm. what was going on. And we see her daughter's grief come through in a really, really big way. We also see just how embedded Teresa is within her 
daughter, son-in-law and grandkids life, like how meaningful um, that relationship is to Teresa, which of course raises the big question of what the heck happens after this. No, I'm happy you brought that up um, because I had a question in my, you know, armchair psychology um, perch. Is there, was, was the daughter suggesting a level of codependence here? Um, what, you know, the, the daughter came right out and basically said, she's here all the time. So I don't know what you guys are going to do with the long distance relationship thing, where I thought there were a couple ways you could take this. The first is they're codependent, meaning like the daughter and the, the mother, uh, Teresa, you know, really they, they just, they're intertwined and you just have to, you know, be part of that. Um, is it the daughter basically saying like, I want my mommy and get away from her because you're not my daddy? Um, or is it like a test where maybe the daughter is like seeing how he's going to respond to adversity, you know, or maybe it's something else, but those are the three things that passed through my mind when I was watching that. Any thoughts? I I don't think it was a test. I think I, it seemed like in that moment, she was externally processing of like, oh my gosh, like how all of our lives can drastically change if Teresa is chosen as, you know, the, the final rose getter of you know, Gary's love journey. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it was kind of that. And that's another type of grief altogether. And so I think that's what we were also seeing happen for Teresa's daughter was like, this is bringing up so much stuff for her. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what she was kind of coming to a realization about. Yeah. So one thing that I noted was that her body language didn't for me seem to match her her words. She was saying the things like, oh, I'm so happy for her and he seems like a nice guy, but her body language was get the F out of my house, please. And that's what I, and then we saw towards the end of the hometown, she had a face to camera where she started to break down. Um, she talked about, you know, her, you know, replacing her father and, and really, really sad sort of touching, um, you know, comments. Um, and so I, I'm kind of wondering, was that body language more reflective of that or, yeah, I, I I thought while watching the daughter, I thought she was the most interesting person there mm-hmm. because she was definitely not in an emotionally stable state. It didn't seem like, and she was all over the place, mm-hmm. and things just were not in. You know, there wasn't continuity among her, you know, and and uh, consistency amongst yeah. what she was saying. Well, you know what I think. I think saying that she wasn't in an emotionally stable place is like could potentially have a negative connotation or, or be pathologizing. I thought the daughter was the most raw and real as it relates to this show and like what they are actually going through. And that's what makes this show so compelling to me is that like these aren't 20 and 30 year olds with no ties, low stakes. Like these are really, really big, big things that are happening. And again, the ripple effect, it's not just about, okay, I'll go pack my bag and move to Indiana. It's, it's all the other stuff. And so I really, really appreciated seeing as you're saying, like, yeah, her her face and words didn't match. Her body language seemed all uncomfortable, uncomfortable all over the place. And the reality is, it is so complicated. I feel like that's been the theme for me, the through line um, that I've been trying to get through as we've been reacting to this series is grief is really complicated. That I believe her when she says, I'm really, really happy for you, mom. You found a great guy. And holy shit, like, I might lose my mom too. And and I, this is making me miss my dad. Like, I really, really felt for for her. Yeah. Um, so I really had two overarching thoughts about um, the Teresa hometown. Um, they weren't really particularly positive. So I'll just spew them out there and you just you just feel free to debunk any of it. Um, one, the, the entire hometown, it didn't matter who in the family we were talking um, to. It, it to me, it just felt like emotional blackmail everywhere. Mm-hmm. It felt like there was a level of like desperation almost to like, you know, where they, it, it almost felt like it didn't matter who Gary was. They wanted Gary to fit into this box yeah. and they were just trying to like, you know, jam that lid shut. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I don't know. It just, it felt like every time there was a conversation with Gary, didn't matter who it was, they were laying certain comments down where it was just like intended to just be a gut mm-hmm. punch where, mm-hmm. you know, and and I didn't really like that, but it was so pervasive across mm-hmm. the entire family um, that you know it wasn't like one or two people. It, and the fact that it was so pervasive um, brought me to my second feeling about it, and that is, if I'm Gary, I am running from that family. Yeah. Like, not that they're bad people. It just 
it to me it feels like there's a real strong amount of emotional baggage there yeah. that i will not be able to compete with i will not be able to overcome um it's one thing if you've got 40 years to overcome it right it's quite another you're 71 how many years do you have to overcome and do you want to spend that mm -hmm. time you know it's one thing when you're in you know alone in your 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 solo time and it's just you and your significant other but you know there are other families that get involved here and you know we've talked about it last week it's probably harder coming in as as a patriarch than it would be coming in as you know some you know low node you know brand new son-in-law type type situation mm -hmm. um yeah, I, I, if I'm Gary, I'm running from that family. And it's not because they're bad people. It's because I don't think I can overcome the emotional baggage with the time I have left on this earth. Mm -hmm. Nor do I want to mm -hmm. at 71. So a, a couple of things. Um, what we've been talking about as it relates to Teresa is that there is this level of kind of desperation that she gives off, especially as it, as it you know, relates to Gary and that she's like so in and like, really diving deep that that through that was very consistent across the family even the the grandkids were saying you know grandma's really lonely she's here all the time like i i, I don't know that i call it emotional blackmail but i think they all have this kind of thirst or this desperation for teresa to find somebody and it's unclear if and and maybe i also felt this way with leslie as well like it's unclear if it's gary or if it's somebody and um, and for Teresa, again, I'm a little bit concerned. I don't know how much dating she's done since her husband died, that this is the first person that she's bringing home is is kind of concerning and a red flag for me in terms of her readiness, her family's readiness, all of that stuff, that this is the circumstance that you're going to bring somebody home. Of course, your your whole family is going to want to, you know, jump on board to this because it's a really big deal. The other thing that you said is if I were Gary, I would go running. You are not Gary. And what we learn about Gary more and more each week, and I'm sorry, um, is he is kind of selfish. You just lost us. You got like I'm five sorry. dislikes for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's kind of selfish. Um, Un unaware, at least. Yeah, um, yeah. And again, I don't think he's like an arrogant egomaniac, that kind of thing. But his ego is really activated. And I'm sure what it felt good to him to think of himself or to be considered by them as this like savior mm -hmm. of Teresa. I think that's what kind of like got his juices going and thought like, yeah, maybe I could love her. Um, I think that's what it's more about for him is that he wants to be that person for someone, that it's more about him and the role that he plays rather than the person. Gary definitely has a lot of, uh, I feel this way, or I like when you do X, or I like when you do, you know, Y. Um, or you make me feel whatever. Um, we all know my feelings on love. I'll repeat them again. It's my job to make you feel a certain way. That is love. When I do something to make you feel good, to further your life, to further your path in some way, shape, or form, um, and to further your story, mm -hmm. that is me demonstrating love. The way you look at me and the fact that, you know, we've been together 15 years and I still love the way you look at me. But guess what? The fact that I love the way you look at me um, is not love. It gets in the way of love. Uh, where, where it's helpful is that because I love the way you look at me, it, it sparks my desire to go and do more for you so that your life is better, right? That's what that emotional connection is designed to do. That emotional connection is designed to, to you know, make it easier for us to make the sacrifices mm -hmm. that embody what true love is. Um, and I'm right now seeing a whole lot of the, you make me feel good, but I'm not necessarily seeing a lot of the sacrifice on the other side coming from Gary right now. That being said, we are on a TV show where it's heavily produced and there's not like, and, and that's one of the big fallacies of a show like this, right? Is that they're not put in a position where you actually can demonstrate mm -hmm. love. Your dates are planned for you. You're like, there's no big great big sacrifices you can make like you it, it's it's mm -hmm. so you you don't actually know how somebody's going to behave out in the real world because they're not put in a place to actually truly engage in the acts of love yeah that's fair that's fair shall we move on to faith hometown yes let's go to benton city washington benton city washington baby yeah a horse town horse town apparently. um she she has horses. It's a legit farm. Um, it seems like we're actually a really cool, picturesque place. Um, her family comes down. I, I her family was lovely. 
Again, I'm going to say this. I'm a biased party. Faith has been my number one from the very beginning. I think she's cruised to the finale. Um, well, she doesn't have a rose yet, so I can't say that. But she's cruised to top three. Um, and and I, I don't think it's particularly close. So I'm I'm obviously a biased party here. But, I mean, the family seemed fantastic. Um, the The house and the whole thing with the horses, cool and interesting. Gary hopped up on there. And from my perspective, while I thought that the I love you for them was the most shocking, it also was the only one of the three that felt actually genuine and real to me. Mm -hmm. It was the one where it was like, oh, that that was that was legit. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was in front of the entire family, but there was still like this locked in. They're always locked in when they're looking at each other, which really I think is really important. We've said that from the first mm -hmm. episode. They've commented on it. Um, and the way that they are just locked in, like the entire rest of the family is not around. Um, I don't know. There was something beautiful to it while at the same time, you know, like the beauty in the middle of a car crash, perhaps is what we're looking at. Um, so yeah, give, give me your thoughts. On the kiss or the whole, the thing? whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I do think I agree that kiss was probably like the most natural, maybe the most organic, the most genuine. Um, things that I, I thought were relevant to point out here, though, on Faith State are we meet her sons mm -hmm. and her sons are, are most, uh, maybe tough on Gary or most skeptical of Gary. They seem very protective of their mom mm -hmm. and they tell Gary, you know, my mom falls really, really hard and she needs someone to catch her. Um, not just the sons, the sister, um, I actually wrote down that, uh, her, uh, comments to Gary felt more like a warning than they did like a welcome. Um, yeah, which I thought was really interesting um, it, when contrasted against the other two ladies' mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the sister kind of took um, more of like a parental role that we typically see in these hometown dates. But I also thought that it, it shows that Faith and her sister know each other really, really well. Because what did we hear last episode with Faith? and Gary on the date and Faith saying, it's really hard for me to open my heart to someone and him saying, don't worry, it's safe with me. And so it's almost like they're having this parallel conversation. And I said to you last week, I was really, really worried about Gary saying, you can trust me with, with this because here, here we have it proven that her heart can't be trusted with Gary. It cannot. And he, you know, I don't think he lied on purpose, but he overpromised here. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, but all that being said, I, I actually like this hometown the most. Mm -hmm. I like this family the most. If I was going to be part of a family, this of, of these are my three choices. This is the one that I want to be a part of. Um, there was a couple things worth noting, though. The, this was the only time of the three that there was a legitimate, genuine conversation about the logistics, mm -hmm. about where they actually live. Mm -hmm. In terms of of Gary and and the lady, you mm -hmm. know, exclude the family conversation and stuff like that, because obviously we had mm -hmm. Teresa's um, daughter. Um, so the fact that this is the only time that we actually saw Gary speak about it with one of the the, the three women, my question then comes up: Is this just a, a producer edit? Is it that Gary is looking for an escape hatch, and this is the escape hatch, or are they having this conversation because she's the one and it's an important conversation for them to figure out if, if, if he's going to pick her at the end of the day um, type thing, because she does not want to leave her, her dead horse. Or yes. And her sons. Yeah. She was pretty. And listen, she kind of like put, put out her expectations and her boundaries. Like my, I don't want to leave my sons and my horse is buried here. I'm not, I'm not leaving Washington essentially. I'm not, I'm, I'm not moving from Washington. Um, I, I imagine slash hope in fantasy suites when the cameras are off and they're not all mic'd up that they're having more of these like logistical conversations, but I don't know. I mean, are they, are they having these conversations and we're not seeing them? I don't know. Or is he having these conversations with just faith because she's the one? Well, if he's not having them with anybody else, then yeah, I think it's a good, a uh, good guess that then faith is the one who's are trying to figure it's, out logistics. It's not an escape hatch that he's trying to I, pull. I guess it could be an escape hatch. I, I didn't really think about that until you, you had said that. Cause this is a classic male thing is bring up, a topic, you know, if you want to break up with a girl, and this, this happens a lot, especially with, with guys that are newer in relationships. And I consider somebody who is literally in his first relationship for the first time in 50 years as he, he's back in the new stage. Um, but classic male behavior is to pick a thread, pull on a thread that you know is going to cause a fight 
and then use that as the grounds to break up. It's a cowardly thing mm -hmm. to do, but it's super, super common for men to do because men don't want to be viewed as like right. the, 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 the bad guy who broke up with the girl. Well, I, I imagine it's even a step further. Use this as a thread to get her to break up with you. That's very common too. But in this show, the girls don't break up with the guy. So, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you can fall back and be like, ah, you know, it was just too far away, you know, and it just wasn't going to work. And, you know, but, you know, she was really close to being one if mm -hmm. we could have got over that. But it just, you know, you couldn't. Yeah. And these other two girls were willing to sort of come in. Well, you know what? Maybe that's a flaw with this, with Golden Bachelor, because at this point in life, in, you know, people in their 60s and 70s, they are already established. They're in their routines. Like, my dad doesn't leave the main road. Like, and we're, we're thinking about spending the rest of our, their lives together. Well, who's going to move? And yeah. so I wonder if it's a flaw in the design and that maybe Golden Bachelor should be regional rather than nationwide. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I, that, that, I actually like that as a, as a concept and idea. Um, because in a country of 350 plus million people, I feel like you can find enough 60 plus year old people it, within a three state range, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's yeah. what they do love is blind. Well, it's, it's actually oh. more city based, but but sometimes we have people like outside the city. But yeah, interesting. All okay, the same location. Yeah, so so it might be tough. You might have an hour commute or whatever mm -hmm. like that, but you're you're within you know you're within commutable distance. No one has to necessarily quit their job, but mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually like that because I, I, I agree with you 100%. They're too embedded at this point in their lives. Mm -hmm. you know. And I think it's a far worse show if you get a bunch of it. It becomes a much more sad and tragic show if you get one uh, contestants that have no families or, or whatever. That just becomes a real depressing show. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah. And that just becomes trauma dumps every single, every single episode. Yeah. That's just too heavy for, for what they're trying to accomplish. Right. Yeah. Speaking of trauma dumps, we go to Minnesota and meet Leslie's family. Interestingly, not in their home. Are they exactly what you were expecting? Yes and no. Why? I mean, if I could have drawn, like, drawn a picture, if I was capable of drawing, this would have basically been her family. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought it was so, so obvious what we were walking into. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also do want to contrast something that I thought was interestingly apparent to me i don't know if everyone else picked up on it but leslie's show wardrobe and her family wardrobe did you note note that they did not converge mm -hmm. this is like they were so different mm -hmm. um i'm wondering if her grandkids are going to watch the show and be like what is grand grand wearing you know no i think they actually call her grandma oh grandma oh that's right that's right yeah um which is also like on brand so us. on brand yeah um, but yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Um, you know, she's been glammed up the entire episode. Um, so Leslie's family didn't surprise you, but her wardrobe did. Uh, what stuck out to you about this hometown? I, I really liked Stuart, Leslie's brother. Seemed like a really, really nice guy, the mensch. Um, and what I thought was probably the most noteworthy of this entire episode um, in a kind of concerning sort of way, because again, over-promising, he, he did actually ask, he tried to hedge it, but he did actually ask Stuart for his blessing. Now, Stuart, um, we learned from, from some commentary, you know, basically took on the father role after the passing of, of Leslie's father. Um, and is like the most important family member to Leslie, um, you, know, you know, out of her entire family. To ask for his blessing, even in the hedged fashion that he did. It wasn't that hedged. It was, if it comes down to Leslie, do I have your blessing to marry her? It was, he did, he did not pull punches. Yeah, well, I, but at least, at least he had the if. He, he led with an if. That's why I give him the credit for the hedge. But again, like. He asked nobody else. Did not ask another permission. No. But again, also, I don't think any of the other women, the other women are, you know, well, Faith is clearly the, the matriarch of her family. You know, you're not getting her sons. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I take your point. This was, I don't know why the internet did not agree with me when I said him saying you're my girl to Leslie was a big fucking deal. But this goes right up there. Like, Gary, what are you doing? So maybe Les, it's it with Leslie. That was his first rose. I'd like to postulate a theory. Fine. Do we think that Faith is the one, clearly and obviously, 
that's the one he's gonna gonna be with at the end. But maybe he just DTF Leslie first. He's like, you know what? I came on this show for marriage. I really, I do want to be be find the person that's gonna be my. And then he met Leslie. He's like, but before we get there, I want to. I'd like I'd like to fuck Leslie first. Do we theories? Um. I think he's very attracted to Leslie. I think we all are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's a lot of like physical chemistry there. I think, I think he could have a really good time with her off camera. While I think there is a really big physical attraction on Gary's part to Leslie, there is a question around their compatibility because we hear multiple times that Leslie does not go for men like Gary. He is so different than any man that Leslie has ever dated. And so it begs the question, is there such a thing as type? And if there is, and Gary is not her type, could it actually work out? Like I get like not wanting to go for the bad boy anymore and like going for like the all American guy, stand up guy. But like, if that's not necessarily what you're actually into and attracted to, could it work? You, you know, absolutely. You know, the, the type of person that you're attracted to is a reflection of several things, your own personal values, your own personal sort of like, you know, baggage that you carry with you. Um, not, you know, some, some things that are, that are our types um, are things we can control. And, you know, some, some of them are not, but at the end of the day, like, Yes, we're all attracted to a certain type of person. I want a, you know, a feminine woman who has traditional, you know, values with respect to relationships. Um, and it really helps out if she's short and uh, brunette. You know. So yeah, there are definitely definitely types. That's not saying that you can't be attracted to somebody that's kind of off type for you. Um, but I think the hurdle um, of making a relationship work. Um, is more difficult, especially if your type is rooted in a value system, you know, because, you know, your type, like is it, your, your type can basically be rooted in your own personal baggage or in your own personal values. It's going to be some combination of the two, right? And so the more that your type is rooted in a value system, the, the better off you are in terms of, or the more likely that that relationship is going to be something that can last and less likely that an off type individual is going to, um, be a relationship that's going to work. In the case of Leslie, I think we can surmise at this point that Leslie's type is not values based, but almost certainly, you know, baggage based, you know, trauma based. Those are the types of relationships where more often than not, you get the inverse of the value situation, right? Where, you know, going off type is probably more likely to work because it's, you know, you, the reason you're picking those types is that you're trying to get something to fulfill as, as you oftentimes talk about. You're trying to fulfill some need that you weren't getting in the past. Um, and oftentimes you pick bad, make bad choices, you know, as, as a result, because you're trying to kind of getting a, getting a quick fix instead of getting something that's gonna be more stable over the long term. So the answer to the question is, if your type is rooted in value systems, then yes, that's what works. Going off type is bad. If you're it's rooted in trauma dump, emotional baggage, and personal experience and baggage, then more often than not, going off type is going to be the better thing to do for a long-lasting relationship. That was a lot of armchair psychology. You are probably cringing inside. What I get right, what I get wrong. I don't know. I don't believe in type. You don't believe in type? I mean, I guess not a not a physical type. No, I mean, to say I don't believe in it, like it doesn't exist is it's not something that like resonates for me. Um, but I do think what you're talking about is compatibility. I think that's different. So Leslie's date is coming to a close and Gary says, and I quote, I heard the saying once, don't walk by an opportunity to tell someone you love them. Leslie, I love you. And this was maybe the fifth time during the episode that I just yelled because that was so avoidable. You didn't need to do that. This wasn't an opportunity that you needed to take. It wasn't even in response to Leslie mm -hmm. when Leslie told him that he loved her. This was so unnecessary and it made me feel so frustrated, particularly because I don't even know what you love about this woman, Gary or Faith or Teresa, because all I've heard him say are things like, I love the way you look at me. 
He told Faith, I love the way you make me feel. So I, I, I'm done with this bullshit. I'm so angry. This, this reached my, I was angry at the Faith I Love You when it came to the Leslie. I was angry, not at Gary, but on these women's behalf. Like it is so selfish. Yeah, these are like, as we let off with, these are gonna hurt on the rewatch. Um, I agree with you 100%. The first thought I had on this was, Gary, that was an unforced error. Like the, you, he didn't actually say it to Teresa. He said it to the family, right? Oh. Which, which fine, okay. He didn't say it to her directly. Um, and there was a little bit of hedging there. So, okay, Faith, it, it felt like they were really locked in. It was response to questions from the family. They were there and I can, I can understand how the Faith one happens, especially if he ends up picking Faith. Um, the Leslie one though, uh, that one I 100% I agree. What what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You didn't need to do that. So, All right, let's get to the rose ceremony. Yeah, oof, man, this one was like I, I oh, it was emotional. It was a roller coaster. Uh, you saw it coming. I thought the most like kind of shocking moment was when he put the rose down, and for a heartbeat, just a split second, I said, "Oh, is Leslie just winning right now? Are we just skipping the rest of the show?" Uh, but yeah. Um, to back it up really quickly, he he comes right out. First rose goes to Leslie. He's only got two roses, obviously. Um, I, you you've said many times in the past that the first person who gets a rose is sometimes indicative and does sometimes matter. Um, you know, I, I feel like we both thought that it's Faith and Leslie, anyways, at this stage of the game. We've thought that for quite a while. Um, but then he just can't give the second rose. He starts, you know, going into what appears to be something akin to a panic attack. He's outside, he's loosening the collar, he's getting some water, he's hyperventilating, he's double over. Yeah, um, give me your thoughts on this on this series of events. My thoughts as a viewer are, you made your bed, Gary, mm. time, time to lie in it. You made this mess, this is the natural consequence, it's gonna feel really, really shitty, and this is what you get. So that was my Amy viewer read on what was going on. My therapist view is is alongside that, which was, I really think Gary got caught up in the moment. I don't think any of this was uh, was like me, like mean or or any any ill intent. And I think it just the reality of what this would mean to one of these women just really hit him all at once. and um, and he just got flooded with, again, all of those emotions of guilt, sadness. Uh, all of it. So hang with me for a second. Let's assume that this was a full-blown panic attack. Okay. In uh, Wearing your therapist hat, mm -hmm. when somebody is in that situation, how do they like de-escalate themselves? How do they like they, they get them through that situation when they don't have like a production company bringing them water? Like assume you're at home studying for a college mm -hmm. exam or something like that and you have a panic attack. What do, mm -hmm. what do you do? So there's a couple of things that you can do. Your body, when you're in a panic or anxiety attack, is in kind of a fight or flight state where your sympathetic nervous system is turned on. And so what you're going to want to do is to find a way to engage your parasympathetic nervous system, the calm center of your brain. And you can do that um, from a physiological basis. And one way to do that is through playing with your body temperature. So when you are in that more fight or flight state, your body temperature is a little bit higher. And what can be really, really helpful and very, very quick is to um, try to lower your body temp with cold water, maybe a cold uh, compress on the back of your neck or on your head, splashing your face with very cold water, holding onto an ice cube. Those things will turn on your parasympathetic nervous system and bring your body to a state of calm. If you have a calm body, you have a calm mind. Another way to turn on your parasympathetic nervous system is through breathing. Um, and so having a like the most effective breath is what's called an uneven breath. Um, and that's a um, shorter inhale and a longer exhale. And that is really effective in turning on your parasympathetic nervous system. There are other, other breathing exercises like box breaths that they actually teach to um, army vets that are struggling with PTSD that again, calm in 16 seconds type of thing to activate parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and then a third thing that you can do is um, typically when you are um, you know, dealing with a panic attack or an anxiety attack, it's really, really hard to get grounded because again, your body's kind of out of control and your mind is out of control. 
And so trying to find a way to just stay present can be really, really helpful. And so it might be um, focusing on a spot on the carpet in front of you or looking around the room and, you know, calling out all the colors that you see or naming all the objects that you see, just something that will bring you to the here and now and outside of your thoughts and feelings. So those would be the three main ways that someone can deal with a panic or an anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. So we need to talk about what actually happened before Gary had his, um, you know, emotional, Episode. emotional thing go on is that he was talking to the women and he was telling them what a difficult decision this was, but ultimately, and I quote, this is my journey. And this is one more step along the way. How did you feel about that? Um, this is not your journey. This is our journey. This is going to be our story. Well, it's sort of tracked with the way that he's been playing this game because that's that's when for me it sort of became like okay now I get why you don't care about throwing these I love you's around because you don't actually see them as people with feelings you see them as a pawn in your journey to get what you want I mean that might be a little harsh I do think Gary is a nice guy but I think that he's unaware of that's a harsh way to put what yeah. he's doing. And again, I don't think he is maniacal. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm more saying that these, this is how he is um, like going through this process. I don't think he actually thinks of them as pawns, but that is how he is treating them. Yeah. Yeah. I hate the whole thing. Um, and in, in a journey like this, I, I, I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong here. But I feel like the real pain is being in the house or in the mansion. It's, it's not being the lead, right? Being the lead, you get to make a lot of choices. You know, you're the one who gets to make all the decisions. When you're in the house, you're dealing with insecurity. You're dealing with competition. You're dealing with, you know, all of the, uh, you know, all of the games that get played. Uh, it's got to be more painful and more of a struggle and more of a journey being a contestant than it is being the lead. Mm -hmm. And so no, Gary, this is not your journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Find me the love story that only has one person in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where there's like a main character. Well, just find find me well, find me a love story with only one only one person in it. Mm -hmm. There isn't one, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I always view it as like like find me a love story where, yeah, there's one main character. And the other character is just a psycho. Has there ever been one that's been successful? I'm sure it's been tried. Hollywood tries all kinds of crap all the time. Find me the successful one, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. So, okay, so we have this rose ceremony ends on a cliffhanger. Leslie gets the first rose and, uh, and we don't really know what's going to happen. It looks like we're gonna find out next week um, before the Women Tell All starts. Um, so your, I, your guess is that Teresa goes home? Yeah, I mean, I've said all along, um, I, I think Faith is, I mean, she should be the front runner for a variety of reasons. I think that we both understand what his appeal is with Leslie, but I think it's a fleeting thing. If it doesn't come down to Faith and Leslie, I don't know what the heck Gary is thinking. Um, but I don't know. He's done some some weird things um, in the past, but, you know, uh, there's no sympathy rose to give here. So yeah, running out of sympathy roses. Yeah, I mean, but there's no sympathy rose to give. So you got to make a call. And is Teresa gonna 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 win out mm -hmm. over over Leslie and, and Faith? I don't think so. Right, right. Well, and and it would actually be doing Teresa a service to let her go now before she even gets in even deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they say I've heard I've heard like in in the Bachelor franchise like sometimes winners will say like they might actually send their runner up home third um, to again, spare them from like the extra, like the proposal aspect, like all of that yeah. stuff. Okay, let's move on to Rosenthorn. Okay. What, what was your Rosenthorn this week? Um, I got a really petty thorn. Okay. Um, I, we already talked about the grandkids and how much I didn't like the grandkids there, but did you happen to see um, when Gary was playing football with, uh, it was, uh, was it Faith's? Uh, yeah, Faith. It was Faith's grandkids. Um, he was playing football with them. Did you see his throw? That guy did not play quarterback at any level. It was off. It was embarrassing. It's like Gary, sit down. 
right? <laughs> like hand that ball off, right? And and run. It was it was such a terrible throw. So that was my that was my road uh, that was my my thorn for the week was um, Gary needs some football lessons before they put him on national TV to throw footballs around. Uh, so uh, what was your what was your thorn? Um, my thorn was hearing yet again that what Gary said he loves about actually two women he used the same line. I love the way you look at me. I'm so over mm-hmm. hearing that. Like I I just it it like is major cringe for me. It is very concerning. Like the the thing that you love is the way that you are reflected back to yourself. Like eek. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Yep. So that was that was my thorn. On top of, of course, I mean I've, I've been very vocal, although I love you. So I just it, it was it's dangerous. It's not safe. Like it it really, really puts the women in an unsafe emotional situation. I'm 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 not not happy. Yeah. All right. And your uh rose. My rose goes to Faith's entire family. Mm. I thought they were lovely. I especially liked her sister. I liked how um, they also like had a nice balance of like protectiveness, but also like openness. And yeah, I thought they were, I thought they were lovely. I thought they were great. Um, And for a family that has experienced a lot of like tumult and trauma, they, they really were like so, so lovely and open and um, and that's that's hard to to get to that point when you've experienced a lot of hardship to just like still remain open and hopeful. So I love that. I, I mean, we are just so unbelievably biased in Faith's favor. Like it's just not like, like sorry, America. We are or in Canada, we, you know, twenty nine percent Canadians. Um, yeah, we are we are clearly just so so biased towards Faith. Um, but uh, but yeah yeah I agree. It, it, her family was lovely. Uh, it, her son seemed really cool. Um, weird rose coming from me um but also in the faith family faith's sister her older sister complete knockout mm-hmm. i mean beautiful woman a faith is beautiful but i mean her sister looked like she was 20 years her, her it could have been her daughter from mm-hmm. from and just yeah i want to know what they're unbelievable- eating and drinking and doing out there what's that country lifestyle I they're know. out there they're out there the crack of dawn hoe in the fields and uh and and getting all the the, the workout in and then eating all their, their homemade organic vegetables and whatnot like it's working oh my god i mean I, I couldn't believe it and then they said the older sister i was like holy cow are yeah. you kidding me yeah. um yeah so and she was also just seemed like a really genuine i really i liked the way she sort of did the little what i call a warning to gary and stuff like that so i i like the sister in general um, but, but yeah, big, big rows on whatever their, whatever their nutrition routine is out, out there. And, uh, that, that, that was, uh, Minneapolis, Washington. Oh, Washington, Faith, Washington. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever they're doing in Washington, man, mm-hmm. keep it up. You guys look great. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that wraps us up for the A side of our reactivity TV this week. Make sure to stay tuned for the B side where we will be talking about Bachelor in Paradise episode six. Um, also, make sure you are checking out our website, revivecfw.com, following along with us on Instagram at revivecfw. And we also have another podcast, Wishing You Well, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a wellness focused podcast where we are navigating all different areas of wellness from nutrition to sleep to exercise to walking, movement, all, all of that. Also, answering listener questions as well. So make sure you check that out if you are navigating your wellness journey right along with us as well. All right. We will see you next time. Take care. Bye. See ya.